Thank you, Ronan, for that, uh, I suppose, a very real life and talk provoking view of, of BIM in Hong Kong. Uh, com I think it reminded me of a, 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 a phrase that the carpenters use, measure twice and cut once, but this is on a much, much larger scale. I think we can only look at envy at uh, the figures you put up for the, the, the size of the construction sector and the money in the construction sector in Hong Kong. And uh, maybe we'll get back to that in, in the Irish economy someday soon, please God. Um, one thing that Ronan forgot to mention, uh, how he came to be here today, was that he watched some of these uh, webcasts from Hong Kong. Um, so anybody watching in a webcast, your, your turn may come if you feel you have and can contribute to, to one of these events. Can, and please. can, I, can I just add to that? Yep. Uh, the reason I ended up here is courtesy of Ralph Montague. I made, I made a one subtle mistake. I sent an email to Ralph, said, Ralph, I'd like to come along and listen to the presentation. And then Ralph spun around, would you actually like to come and give a presentation? So through the LinkedIn networking system, I didn't, I'd never actually met Ralph, but I'd heard about this se seminar series. So I volunteered myself to attend and ended up getting requested to speak. So anybody who's watching online, you can put your hand up, you might actually get invited to speak. Okay, before we get into the workshop, which will take about 40 minutes, um, we'll take a few questions from the floor for Ronan. I can move it on there, but turn on here. Uh, Gerald Madigan, Punch Consulting Engineers. Uh, you mentioned that the contractor was responsible to produce the BIM model and any issues that he found after producing the BIM model he had to resolve along with the design team. How, how, if he finds a major issue, how does he get paid for that then? So under the contract, he still gets paid for materials, time and cost. Okay. Right, so what the, what the, consult, what the, what the client is trying to avoid is a delay, okay. and they're trying to avoid extension of time. So the client, if there's a major problem, the client will ultimately have to pay for design revision, design amendment. But they want to do it before the contractor starts work. It's a lot cheaper to fix something on a drawing than it is when it's cast in concrete on site. So the contractor will still get paid where they're due pay, but what the, what the client is trying to do is avoid major problems on site causing delay and then ex extension, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're trying, to, they're trying to identify the problem as quickly as possible. Okay, so it's in his interest so yeah. to, to find it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Angus O'Keefe from Ronan and O'Donovan Consulting Engineers. How, as a BIM consultant, have you been involved in uh, the coordination between the structural uh, engineering's model and their analysis? Um, not directly. So we, we, we can give consulting engineers advice, but when you try and link, for example, a Revit platform to a CSC analysis platform or something of that nature, you need to talk to the vendors about how those things link together. So we, we don't delve into that level of detail. If a consulting engineer comes to me and says, I have a problem, we'll certainly look at trying to figure that problem out. But in terms of the role of a coordination role, we leave those real technical issues to the actual vendors. We can broker a deal. We can try and get them in and try and sort them out. But generally, the engineer has to figure that out with the vendors. And, and secondly, when the clients specify in some cases that they want it done through BIM, is, are they specifying the IFC or just a general BIM or like a, is there a particular format of, so, of um, information exchange that they're looking for? Um, the current default is that they latch on to one or other system. So the MTR have been using, for example, MicroStation and Bentley as their predominant system. And because that particular platform is not as developed as, say, Revit, they've ended up using Revit for their BIM platforms. So they tend to, the clients tend to lean on one form or another. So one of the clients prefers Geary Technology Platform over some other platforms. So they tend to stipulate an actual particular software brand. Um, when it comes, the clients can do that themselves, but we tend to look at the industry and see what skill sets are in the industry. So one of the big reasons that we couldn't go down the Bentley route is there's not enough experienced BIM Bentley guys in the marketplace in Hong Kong, where Autodesk are the gorilla in the room, if you like, they're the biggest guys there, 80%, 85% of consultants use the Autodesk and Revit platform. So it's the easy one to get up and running. But the notion of IFC is, is fantastic and it's fundamental, but it hasn't actually taken any traction in Hong Kong as of yet. 
Peter uh, Mandel, Academate, sorry. <laughs> Ronan, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting and well-delivered presentation. Um, I have a question on BIM standards. Mm. You mentioned that uh, the Housing Authority in Hong Kong have a BIM standard, and you also have a paper com comparing the governments in the US and Hong Kong. Is there any standard that's going to be worldwide, or is anyone looking at that to coordinate it across borders, for example, with mainland China and Hong Kong? Are people looking at those sort of... That one is levels? one of those too, too difficult to chew problems. So every, every little jurisdiction is looking at it from a different, different perspective. And we're not a global practice by any stretch of the imagination. We have no footprint in China, yet we're operating in China. So we're operating in Hong Kong, but we've never done any work, any real work in Shanghai or Beijing or any other city. And the, the barriers to entry are language barriers, cultural barriers, and the, the industry is a very, very different setup. So I don't foresee a day when there's going to be a global standard for BIM. We don't have a global standard for steel design. So I don't see how we're going to ever get a global standard for BIM. So I think you're going to end up with local definitions. What we're seeing is a global understanding of the processes required. And you're starting to see these, these kind of BIM project manager roles becoming recognized in juris different jurisdictions. But it's like the American litigation system is very different to the, to the Irish system and is again very different to the, the Hong Kong system. So what works in America won't work in Hong Kong and, and all these kind of issues. So I don't think we're ever going to see a global standard, but you'll start to see echoes of each one in, the, in different countries, but they'll be specific to each different location. Thank you. One at the back and one at the front. Uh, Jim Roach from the School of Architecture, DIT. Um, you talked a lot about the, that there were different models being made by the different disciplines. Yep. Uh, my understanding of the process that, that is that ultimately there, there should be one model that all the different disciplines can work on. Is that the case? Um, in short, no. So what we're finding is that we have to reflect the silos in the industry. And there is no one authoring software that covers all the different disciplines. So what we're doing is we're enabling the architect to do their work, enabling the engineer to do their work, and then finding ways to translate those models to the contractors. And then we use a tool like Navisworks as a compiler. So you can use Navisworks or Salibri as an alternative. And they can actually compile all the models. So you can have one file, which is linking all the different authoring applications into one source. But the actual authoring software, we find it's actually better discipline by discipline by discipline. And even on the, on the MEP part, we have an electrical model, a mechanical model, a plumbing model, and a drainage model. Now, all of that process has been born out of very large, very complicated projects. So you might find that on a smaller project or a, a, a residential project, you might actually get everything stuck into one application. But on these large mega projects that we're working on, you have to have many, many different files. And in okay. fact, we don't even have one structural file. On some projects, we have seven or eight structural files because the models, the buildings are so massive and the models are so heavy, you have to actually break down each discipline into separate files. So there is no one single file that you can say, oh, that's the building. There's a whole collection of many, many files. I have a related uh, question. Uh, you showed a cartoon of a donkey at a computer there. Yeah. And uh, you've referred to the fact that it, there's clearly a huge um, learning curve and uh, t time commitment by all the disciplines. Um, do, can you talk a bit more about that? And do, do you think there's a danger of uh, uh, a de-skilling process happening with that, with that commitment that's needed? A de-skilling in, in a broader uh, um, knowledge of technology, for example? It's actually, we, we could debate this all morning. There's a, there's a there's a consensus that there's the skill base in the industry is declining. So the actual knowledge that architects and engineers have is actually declining compared to their elders and their peers. But when people have implemented the technology, because you're actually working in effectively the real world on a computer, when it comes to detailing, say, architectural details like walls meeting roofs and floors meeting walls, you have to actually figure out the details. So the, the software doesn't do it for you. So it's not like you're going to build me a slab, build me a wall. You have to actually go through the detailing process. So people who are using the authoring tools, particularly graduates, they're having to ask some pretty fundamental questions about how do you actually build this? How does this actually get put together? How does this actually get fabricated? So they're actually learning about the building process by actually building these models. So in answer to your question in a roundabout way, 
I actually believe that when, if people are given the training to use the technology and they're giving the mentoring in terms of how things get built, they will actually learn more about construction by actually building these models than simply drawing lines in a 2D CAD file. So there's actually an opportunity, like HOK have found that their junior architects, they, their knowledge accelerates if they've been in, involved in the BIM process because they have to figure out how all these things fit together in a computer model to be able to produce a drawing. So I think it actually helps people learn rather than actually diminish their skill set. Okay, thanks. Who's a lucky man? Thanks. Um, it's just a question in relation to the procurement and the, the models itself. Um, is the, are the design teams using generic information to produce their models with the contractors using actual product information? I'm not, I'm not sure if you saw the, the last session we had here in terms of um, the, the families, if you like. Yeah. Um, does, is, is that the culture in, in Hong Kong? Uh, in, in terms of public procurement over here, we, I can see it becoming an issue in terms of um, contractors um, using specific information and, and um, design teams having to use generic type information and coupled with that, do you find that the industry is able to support the, the design teams in terms of the level of information to have in terms of their family support? It's, a, it's another interesting issue because I watched the presentation last month and what they're doing is fantastic but they're, he they're quite kind of ahead of the curve. Because the consultants are now waking up to the whole BIM thing and they're starting to realize that, oh, I can put in a pump or I can put in an escalator or I can put in a certain screen or whatever, or I can put in a certain piece of equipment. But then when they go and find, try and find those libraries, the manufacturers haven't actually produced those libraries. So I'll give you a simple example. I was at a conference in Hong Kong a month ago and Philips were the key sponsor, the, the lighting company, and they had phone books, literally, of brochures of all the different lighting types and all the lighting performances and everything else. And I emailed the sales director and said, do you have this in a, in a BIM system? And they email back on what's BIM. So, so the manufacturers haven't figured it out yet. And I think, in, certainly in Hong Kong, on the design side, we use generic components. And we have a few tricks up our sleeve where if we're putting, for example, a mechanical piece of equipment in, we put it as a simple object, we'll name it in a certain way. So when we actually get the manufacturer's details, we can replace it. So if that component exists 100 times in the model, we make, make one replacement and replace it across the whole file. So, but the actual suppliers are not giving anybody the information to allow them to populate the model. Yeah. A few of the clever ones are starting to realize that if they get ahead of the curve and the architect starts specifying it, it's most likely to get purchased. Exactly. Even if it's not necessarily the cheapest. So the manufacturers are starting to wake up at the same time the consultants start to wake up and it will come together pretty rapidly. But at the moment, it's all generic. Yeah, what we, can find, what we see here at the moment is they're very slow to... Um, in terms of support, we, there's very limited in terms of, um, and we're having to spend an inordinate amount of time generating um, where we could, should be just essentially, I would like to see just being a drag and drop at this stage, but, but we're far from that as far, from what I can see. But there's two, there's two fundamental problems. The first fundamental problem is nobody knows anybody's commitment. So, so one of the challenges with all of these technologies is we, we operate in an industry where you don't know where the next job is coming from, from one day to the next. So there's no commitment to develop very clever systems. So the suppliers are going to, well, these guys, they're just going to faff around. They don't know what they're doing. The second problem is software interoperability. If, the, if a vendor wants to create a drag and drop system, he has to create it for Archicad, he has to create it for Revit, he has to create it for Tecla, he has to create it for all Bentley and any other platform that's out there. They don't want to invest the money in that. So it's easier for them just to ignore the problem for a while and see what happens. So it's, it's one of those chicken and egg things. Okay. What, there's one more there. He's, he's dying to ask a question. Okay. Last one. Last, last one. We might get a chance later after we have the microphone. <laughs> oh, God. That's a difficult question. Sorry. Uh, Roland Tonell, the senior architect in the uh, Ofsof Public Works. Um, cultural question. Uh, the clients or the organizations, say the institutional organizations you've worked with, like the Housing Association, from your experience with working with them, how could you talk a little bit about how they had to transform? Uh, the ways they work, um, or you know, how difficult was it for the uh, champion that you mentioned there, the lady in the housing corporation? To did she have to go through all her legal uh, setups, her procurement contracts? Uh, was it just hiring the right people and then it was flying along, or was there a, a, a long process where, you know, and as you described just there now, um, 
there is a way between like everybody's looking at the ideal BIM model, the one model, and everybody working. Obviously, you're working in a way towards that, and there is an in-between one where the silos are still there, and we can work with that. We're going to face the same thing if we want to implement that, say, even as a client. We are looking at the ideal. But we have government standard contracts, fixed price contracts, you know, even trying to hire. We had a discussion uh, last week, just at the top of our head, you know, if you want to hire a um, construction consultant to even start imagining how you're going to build something at the design stage, we'd have to go to a contractor, then we can't have that contractor bidding for the construction because there might be conflict of interest. So you really have to look at all those cultural and uh, legal issues to start trying to break down those barriers and even move along those things. So from your experience, I would be very interested for any comments or... Um, I, I use the analogy the microwave culture. We live in a time where everybody puts something in a microwave, goes beep, 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 30 seconds is ready. In terms of what they've done in the housing authority, they've taken a 10-year roadmap. So they've been sensible. So we're not going to transform this organization in, in an overnight. We're not even going to transform it over the next year. So they've got this long-term roadmap. So they started off, let's get the architects to make some of these BIM models and see how they get on. And let's bring in a training organization to support them. And once the, once the architects got a bit more comfortable with the idea of these BIM models, they could start seeing success. Then they went to the structural engineers and said, look, this is really clever stuff. So after a year or two, we said, on the next project, we're going to we'll have the architect and we'll have the structural engineer and we'll think all these models. And then on the next project, we'll have the e &M guys come and play. And we'll just do the drainage. We won't, we won't make it too complicated. We'll just do the drainage and we'll just do it at the podium level. So they basically start getting people comfortable with the whole idea. And then gradually, they start getting involved. Now, they've been very clever. They've identified the more likely people in the organization to actually take to it. So they get champions who run with it. And then they create their own buzz. And then you know, the curious people start getting involved. And by the time the curious people start getting involved, all the naysayers get sucked along behind them. So there's this whole culture of how you plan out change to the, the process. Some things work, some things don't work. And they've gone back and changed them and they modified them. And even down to the way they're procuring. So they were procuring BIM training services. And their procurement system was, we never, we've never actually worked for Housing Authority. In, in, the, in the, the five or six years they've been doing it, we've actually, as an organization, never worked with the Housing Authority. Because the procurement system is such that if you've never worked with them, you can't work with them. Right? So, there's, so they're now looking at the procurement system. How do we actually get because we can't get the technical marks to compete with the other guys. So we can't, we can't actually work, even though we've done these, all these large, complicated projects, we've never done a housing job. So if we haven't done a housing job, we can't do a housing job. So they're now realizing, oh, we've got to change our procurement methods. So it's not, it's not an overnight success, and they've got many, many years ahead of them to make it work. Okay, we may get some more questions near the end.